Good morning to all our viewers. It's a bright Saturday morning in Bangalore. And Nagabhushanam wears many hats even in her career. Uh, she has headed several business schools as the dean and director and is currently the director of Ramaya Institute of Management in Bangalore. And as uh, recently as yesterday, uh, she, on behalf of her institution, accepted the award for the best curriculum design adaptation conferred by Education Today. Hartiyas, congratulations to you and your team, Dr. Manasa. Um, Dr. Manasa has also been very actively working towards the dissemination of the national education policy. Her articles, lectures and webinars are much uh, sought after. She's also the member of the Curriculum Development Committee under the task force, uh, which is working towards implementing the national education policy in Karnataka. In fact, uh, she has been nominated as a member of the expert committee by the government of Karnataka to look into the legislations um, you know, uh, related to the Right to Education Act. And she's also the president's nominee to the Edu Executive Council of the Central University of Karnataka in Kalpurgi, as well as uh, a member of the Executive Council of Center for of Educational and Social uh, Studies. And trust me when I say this, this is just a capsule of the numerous contributions and achievements that she has um, you know, uh, uh, brought into uh, her uh, ambit towards enhancing education in India at various levels. Um, on behalf of the National Human Resource Welfare Association Trust, I take great honor in welcoming you to today's session, Dr. Manasa. Uh, I think you're muted. Yeah, thank you, Kirtana. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, our media partners, iAsia News Music, for the live broadcast of this discussion via Facebook and YouTube across 170 plus countries. So, uh, Dr. Manasa, to begin with, um, you know, uh, what I wanted to uh, understand and for the benefit of our multiple viewers is that the national education policy has been formed to create an India-centric education system. So can you please elaborate on this as to what do, what do they mean by India-centric? Thank you, Kirtana. Thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction that you have given me. So when we say national education policy is India-centric, okay? If you look at the history of education in India, we had pre-independence. That is, even before the colonial rule, we had ancient education system in practice. That is the Gurukulas, and the Gurukula system was in work. But later, what happened? Macaulay in 1834, he was very much for uh, the Western culture and the Western education, the British system, whatever was existing in Britain, same education was brought in India. So not that it was bad. Of course, it gave a direction, it gave a structure, and we moved forward with this new system. But the ecosystem, now we have realized that the ecosystem was different in our country. So this national education policy, whatever we are talking about today, is a, uh, takes into account what has been the past of the country. What is the cultural heritage that we bring in? And it also considers what is the current situation in India? What kind of a professionalism is required? How is the IT sector doing and how is the growth that is happening in the industry? What is the startup culture? So taking into account all these, you know, the past, the present, and the future. So taking into account all these, the national education policy has been framed. So when we say that it takes into account the future, the national education policy is not for the child of today. It is not for us who have all, almost in the verge of completion of our service. It is for those children today who are five year old or four year old who will be experiencing education throughout their lives. Okay. So, for them, so what kind of a professionalism has to be brought about? How they contribute? They have to contribute to the nation. So all these things have been taken into consideration, and the national education policy has been framed. So that's why I say that it is more India centric. Because the formal structure of education, which we had, ignored many things, 
like it may be community knowledge that we have or whatever uh, with different knowledge structures and systems that we had had been ignored completely and even the style of teaching it was more uh, top down approach okay uh, that is frontal method of teaching was adopted but if you see what is being suggested in the national education policy is something very different when we talk about multidisciplinary education one of the major breakthroughs of the national education policy we had nalanda takshashila and vaishali such universities in the past which talked about multidisciplinary education right but today we are working in silos a commerce graduate doesn't know about arts a arts graduate doesn't know about science and we don't have a overall perspective as to how to approach different problems of the society or the industry very true so, yeah what requires is in in, in the industry or in a reality setup you know you require a multidisciplinary approach if you have to solve the problem just take the example of waste management so waste management does not require only one kind of an approach but we need to understand the society we need to understand science we need to understand how the various vendors are operating see if you look at this particular problem you know it requires a multidisciplinary approach so that is what special education policy suggests and i wanted to say that it is more india centric in this way it is india centric absolutely i think uh, what you said uh, definitely you know uh, makes it more clearer for a lot of us who are not very aware of um, the national education policy so last september um, you know i understand that the new 12 member national uh, steering group was formed under shri kasturi rangan who has also chaired uh, the uh, nep drafting group of 2020 right so what is the vision for 21 22 and beyond uh, that you as one of the council members are envisioning when it comes to making education more rounded for uh, students uh, See, i'm not, i'm not in that committee actually that is the ncf national curricular framework which is being uh, framed by uh, kasturi rangan and the team okay but i was a part of curriculum development only in the karnataka part okay when we created the first you know, karnataka was the first state to start the implementation to talk okay, about institutional development plan to talk about curriculum framework so it was the first state to start that and because it was an initial steps that we took uh, i was a part of those uh, that uh, curriculum development committee but now there are two parts to this national education policy one is the school education as we all know the other is the higher education so the entire higher education is driven by ugc only that is the university grants commission and if you take school education this ncf whatever kasturi rangan committee we are talking about so they are the national curriculum framework for school education see in 2005 we got the earlier national curricular framework for school education but in light of nep today this committee is looking at what are the changes need to be brought in the national curricular framework so apart from this there will be task force at every state level as you all know uh this is a um, um a concurrent uh, education is on the concurrent list it is both the center and the state which participates in the policy framing so every state has a responsibility and we all know that there is something called as ncert as well as dserts so they are given the responsibility of taking up this curricular framework lot of position papers are being generated at the state level in karnataka some 22 position papers have been done taking into account every aspect of the national education policy these uh, will be submitted to the national curricular framework like how karnataka is submitting even other states will also submit and the national curricular framework committee will look into it and they will develop the national curricular framework so i heard that four aspects are being taken for the national curricular framework one is the early childhood care and education the other is the primary as well as school education part of it and uh, it will also take care of uh, the uh, bridging the gap between the educational 
system, the school education as well as the higher education. So multiple facets of school education will be taken care by the national curricular framework. But if you look at the UGC, UGC is also implement is coming out with a large number of uh, guidelines. Okay, it has already worked on academic bank of credits. It has already worked on multidisciplinary education. The draft is out, and it is on uh, the public domain for public to react on that. National higher education qualification framework, which was much awaited has also been released. So uh, this includes national skill qualification framework and national vocational education qualification framework. Uh, institutional development plans as a part of governance of these institutions was one of the major things. So that has also been done. International education guidelines has also been developed. So all these are for public debate and I can say that this is one of the largest democratic process that we have seen in our country, whether it is a national education policy or it may be the implementation of the national education policy. So in both the cases, the public participation is made a very, very important dimension. So that's how a nationwide feedback is collected on every document that the UGC releases and once people react to it then the required changes will be brought about in the qualifications framework and will be implemented if you tell me like two months or three months back when we talked about national education policy we were really clueless how it will be implemented those questions were left just like that but today we have very good guidelines. Everything has been developed. So I think that our country is going to make a very good, good progress in terms of the implementation of the national education policy. So this is just what I wanted to say about what's happening today. No, that was very comprehensive. And I do have a few questions based on, um, you know, what you uh, just said. Uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was, you know, um, so um, I, I remember pretty well uh, while I was, uh, you know, researching on this topic even a few weeks back about uh, the NEP's, uh, NEP 2020, you know, it had a goal of restructuring the educational system in India by 2040. So they've given themselves like a 20 year uh, timeline. And you said a lot of these policies are now up for public debate. So uh, would you be able to share like a few things that we can likely expect to see uh, in the near future, um, you know, to begin with? Yeah. So then I have to tell you what are the policy points, basically. <laughs> if, they, if, they are, if they are open, yes, it will be yeah. interesting. No, no, know. I'm talking the poly the education policy is already there. So these are only the guidelines as to how to implement. So the education policy, if you look at, at the school level, there are certain major changes that have been brought about. One is the structure of education itself. Whatever we had that three plus um, uh, three years of ECC, now it has been made five years of ECC. That is early childhood care and education. So it brings even the Anganwadis into the fold. See, earlier Anganwadis was treated very differently by the health sector. Today it becomes a part of the education sector. Okay. That is one big change we, which we will be looking at that catching them very young. Okay, children. So from there itself, they're working on what is the foundational literacy, what is foundational numeracy, what are the changes that has to be brought at a very early age. And then we were all complaining about the homeworks and a lot of work given to children. So uh, national education policy has announced bagless dates. There are days wherein children will not carry any bag. So education is become, going to become more experiential in nature rather than becoming only knowledge based, giving only one side of it, you know, because today uh, outcome based education is what is stressed upon. The entire policy right from school education to higher education talks about only outcomes. What will be the outcome? So if a student is graduating from my institution, it is not that what marks he scored, but even the marks he scores, you know, should be a reflection of 
whether he will be able to perform after leaving my institution that's very true so that is outcome based education so we are talking about outcome based education at all levels so we are looking at what the children need to become rather than what they need to do today okay so keeping in mind we are reengineering the whole thing the education system is completely reengineered taking into uh, account the outcomes that we need to achieve what are the graduate attributes okay so looking at that we are working backward and that is one of the uh, major shifts that uh, the national education policy brings in to uh, our uh, country and apart from this in the higher education space there will be a major restructuring of the institutions there will be only three kinds of institutions see all these years we had multiple institutions like we had autonomous institutions we had uh, uh, funded uh, what is that deemed universities and we had state universities central universities affiliated colleges all this structure you know there there's a major structural change so you have only two nomenclatures for the university either it will be a research university or it will be a teaching university in research university the major focus is research and teaching is less and in a uh, uh, this one what is that uh, teaching university teaching is the major focus and research will also be a part of it okay so this kind of a structural change and then affiliation system will be uh, we are giving away the uh, affiliation system and it will become all autonomous institutions so you know what kind of an autonomy how does it help the institutions autonomy helps the institutions in creating their own curricular framework it helps the institutions to you choose their innovative styles of methodologies uh, their own assessments way of assessments because all these days it was examination centric education what we were doing but now it is a learner learner centric education that national education policy so like this if i keep talking there are many such changes which have been brought about okay lesser curriculum lesser, lesser curriculum content but more emphasis on experience more emphasis on learning so these are some of the aspects that uh, national education policy brings about this is this is um, as a parent uh, to two young children who are still like at the primary levels of school i think this is a very heartening thing to listen to because definitely children today are exposed to so much of information and and this is i'm talking about right from you know their childhood levels to you know children who are there in college and university today so the amount of information that they get from various sources is so much that um and the kind of jobs that are available in the market the kind of entrepreneurial uh, you know experiences that we get to listen to and see is so wide that everywhere there's an opportunity to you know make a career out of it so i think this kind of a very rounded and inclusive education system is very very important so that uh, brings me to my next question but before that i would request all the participants and the viewers who are there across our multiple channels including those who are there on the nhrwa panel uh, today i request you to kindly keep your sessions uh, sorry your questions for uh, a little later in the session because we might miss out on your questions if you ask them during the conversation so uh, i will make an announcement and then you can start sending in your question for dr manasa to answer thank you very much so uh, dr manasa one uh, uh, you know uh, a specific question that i had to you and which is of very personal interest to me as well is what are the specific steps that are being taken to bridge the gap between education in the government schools versus the private schools especially considering the fact that at least in karnataka <coughs> i have personally heard of several government schools that are being closed in various districts including in bangalore um you know while uh, a lot of uh, while private schools are mushrooming and there's this massive gap especially in the fees that you know parents pay so um and i'm sure it's it's not just qual uh, it's not just the quality uh, part part of it there must be a lot of other things as well and as i'm sure you're aware uh, private school fees in bangalore is just skyrocketing by the year so uh, what do you uh, uh, how do you envision this and do you think there is some kind of a check or some kind of a respite that people are going to have and are we going to see a qualitative uh, a quality based education coming back into government schools and seeing more of them mushrooming around the country, uh, state okay with respect to this 
as i told you national curricular framework becomes a very common uh, it's it is going to become a common thing for all the institutions okay even with respect to languages or whatever see there was a divide because of the english education and the regional languages so this problem has been sorted out by the national education policy that children have to be taught in bilingual methodology of teaching okay that is one answer to this so i can tell you that i myself have worked with government schools and we developed uh, seven case studies of the best government schools both in kerala as well as karnataka so if you look at that government schools have a lot of initiatives and they are doing really well but only thing is it required the uh, infrastructural support and then it required but now there are a large number of ngos which are working in this space to promote these institutions and then uh, even the alumni of the those schools you know they come back and they give back to their institutions so such things are happening in schools uh, we want that divide has to be reduced in future see it is basically a mindset issue that parents do not they think that whatever appears you know the tangibles based on the tangibles we go with the schools and then if you look at what is in the core okay is very very strong very recently i had visited a school at chikbalapur and then we did some kind of a orientation to the children but i could not find that the children are no less than anybody so that that's how they are also emerging so uh, as the industry grows lot of rural manpower and the government school children also come into this fold okay so there is no need to close this government schools but now already some of the schools have also introduced english medium you have to visit one school called thyamagundlu near nelamangala if you see the kind of ict that the teachers are, ado are adopting even our institutions don't do that so that's how the ict information communication and technology so how the youtubes are being youtube videos are being generated and how such forums are also being conducted by those schools you know so they are also gearing up and we need to understand and it's a bigger responsibility of the society and uh, the national education policy strengthens the sdmcs that is school development management committees so school development management committees have a lot to big role to play and the national education policy de defines the sdmcs very clearly and what they need to be doing so i think the implementation of the national education policy will also bring in freshness in the way government schools are functioning but what perceptions we have seeing at the private schools is not really true that is what i wanted to tell you that is uh, very true in fact just last week last saturday we were in conversation with dr mamta gauda who has uh, you know uh, done a lot with regard to you know in, in as you said involving the anganwadi uh, workers as well as you know improvising the way uh, government schools function especially in uh, the districts of uh, ramnagar and uh, she was saying that a lot of students actually transferred from private schools to the government school because the quality had improved so i think everywhere parents are more concerned about the quality of education that is being imparted and i think if that can be fixed uh, we can definitely have a very good balance in the kind of education that is being offered uh, to no, the divide is going to go away that that's With that's very education. that's very divide very heartening to hear that is what is expected wonderful so um now uh, coming to you, you know you've been the head of uh, several management schools i can't even count them and uh, you know even today you head the ramya institute of management so what has been your focus with regard to bridging this gap between uh, the education sector and the manpower requirements in the industry okay the first uh, thing what uh, as a, a head of the institution i would be doing is that looking at how many faculty are really exposed to the real world okay there is a big gap between the academicians and what is happening in the industry until and unless faculty gear up to this level understanding what really happens in the industry and what is there in the textbooks so the textbooks whatever we have that is the knowledge we already have it in us because we have traversed a long way as faculty right but 
we need to understand how what are the dynamics that are in the corporate world or the industry world so those changes will have to capture very fast okay so doing that otherwise what happens you know even our students will be much ahead of us that's the thing that's so very true we will not be able to answer them so they are much ahead of us so until and unless faculty engage with the user systems maybe the industry maybe the government maybe the non governmental sectors or whatever institutions that are there so until and unless they engage with them you know they cannot bring to the table the best of best what is required by the students so we do lot of things actually we have uh, some industry council being established and the industry members constantly come and review our curriculum we have lot of brainstorming sessions with the industry to change the curriculum you know so that kind of a interaction with the industry is very much required so until and unless we do that it is going to be a very big gap we have been talking about industry academia gap but i feel that most of the institutions do not know how to engage because uh, we work from semester to semester just taking keeping examinations in our mind see examination and assessment is a part of the whole culture right it has to happen like any other class happens so if we give more importance to the examination if we don't have micro plans being developed for the delivery in the classes right we will be working on because everything will be a jugaad in such institutions that's very true so what i suggest is i constantly appeal to all the faculty every time that you make your work easy you make your teaching easier you just connect with the industry don't go with the text don't go with the concepts go with the live examples and then connect it to the concepts that is the way we have to do it and then until uh, if we don't do consulting and research for companies you know then we are really we will not be able to deliver what is required by the students so every faculty has to connect to the user systems industry they'll have to work on live projects they'll have to do it only if they do it then it you can bring back this one so whenever i talk to any of these uh, corporate forums like it may be any uh, chambers of commerce uh, what i tell them is first i don't say that our students are available for internship i will just say that our faculty will work with you on real problems wonderful okay. so first is our faculty should work with the real problems and our faculty always have a good rapport with the students they can take this support of the students and do it so if you just it's a escape route if you don't allow the faculty and send the students we are not aware what the students are doing there until and unless we capture like this you know i think it is going to be very difficult that gap between the industry as well as the academia still continues so we'll have to find out meaningful ways innovative ways of getting along with the industry so what we have done is 10% of the course will be taught by people who are working on the fields that is alive uh, whether it is in the corporate or government or non governmental organizations so that kind of a flexibility you need to bring about and then allow the faculty to empower them because what we are doing is generally we find in all the institutions they are bothered more about the regular processes to establish the processes correctly in the institution and faculty will have lot of time to all these things so today we are not measured by what are we teaching we are measured by outcomes so what are the outcomes so we need to think what are the outcomes for the faculty until and unless we do that this bridging of the gap becomes very very difficult so i think that uh, we do the same thing and then we put everybody on the live projects it is an embedded system that we have whether it is empirical projects or any other industry projects or summer internship pro uh, program see that disconnect has to be avoided students do something and they come back the faculty doesn't know what is happening right. so having a very good uh, student faculty ratio is also very critical in this because if we have 
80 students versus one faculty, 40 students versus one faculty, it is not possible. We work on it at least one basis. For every 12 students, there is one faculty. That is the ratio that Ms. Maya has it. So that's uh, this, you know, this will have a very positive impact because faculty, more faculty are there to cater to the needs of the students. So this kind of bridging of gaps, we need to find out what are those innovative ways. I have worked on many things like the quality circles within the institution, how industry will interact with them. And I have, I constantly interact with the industry for everything. Okay, until and unless I do it, my faculty will not do. If my That's faculty right. won't do, students will be totally left in soup. That's so very instead true. of that, it has to start, especially in this case, we have to have a top-down approach. That's that's very true. And in fact, I think uh, considering the uh, kind of exposure that even, uh, you know, high school students have before they get into university and pre-university, I think uh, it's it's uh, very important that even schools start, uh, you know, bringing in a lot of people from the industry who can talk at their level and introduce them to, you know, uh, real world concepts at their level, because then they can start making decisions um, of, about the career that they uh, want to choose or the career path that they want to follow in a more informed manner. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very uh, pertinent uh, point that you have stated. So uh, there are uh, one thing is, see, academic thinking is very different. Uh, industry thinking is different. True. Academic thinking is also very good. It is very strong and it is based on some very strong competencies. But only thing is we don't have that connect. Industry, they are quick in decision making. They take decisions like this and they want to capture the market. So whatever it is, whatever achievements, that is they work from, I always say they work from quarter to quarter. We work from semester to semester. Okay. So they are bothered about their profits and we are bothered about our students' uh, examinations. So both will have to change. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. So industry has to accept the academics. Many a times, you know, when we have met uh, some industry people, they say that if you are an academician, we don't want you to do any work for us. We want, see, I am a, I've been a researcher for, have worked on many corporate projects. So the first thing when I say that I'm an academician, immediately they say that we don't want academicians to work on our project because academicians make things more complex. What industry wants is Everything has to be made simple. Correct. So we have to move from move from complex to simple. But of course, our faculty have learned complex things, but they need to understand how to make it simple. Right. right. So these things, uh, these dynamics, you know, if we have a very good match between these two, it is possible. Uh, welcome that industry members come to the academia, but at the same time, they'll also get groomed with all these whatever requirements. So in the, within the institution also, the lot of uh, fixed thinking is there. Those uh, walls, you know, we need to break. So once we, we break these walls, I think uh, it will be very good that you can have a very good interaction with the industry. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so um, uh, one, one more very pertinent one. So while we were talking uh, just some time back, I did mention about the need for, you know, students to be, made more aware about the multiple career opportunities that are available, right? So do you think a lot of vocational training should be made part of the regular curriculum um, in any sort of a high school, um, you know, environment, just so that they're more industry ready? Yeah, now, uh, uh, once again, if I have to go back to the national education policy, all these years, vocational education was not in the mainstream. We had a number of diploma courses and all that, you know, where you focus more on vocational education and then it was separated from the mainstream education. So now the national education policy clearly brings vocational education into the mainstream. Okay. Okay. So the multidisciplinary education starts at 9th standard, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, not in the undergraduate level. Multidisciplinary education starts at 9th standard plus the skill integration will also happen. So we also have this national skills framework. When we talk about this multiple entry exit system that has been introduced by the national education policy, 
the first year you know it is more about skills only the student can quit the institution after one year with a just certification and he can all he or she cannot start working so from skills to research from skills to knowledge knowledge to research that's how this progresses education so skill is the basis it has been made as a foundation now so at a very early age you know especially why skills have been integrated is like if you look at uh, the rural sector wherein children you know drop out very fast because of the economic requirements so taking into account all these at a very early age skills have been integrated and also uh, some of the areas for example if you can take uh, some north karnataka region like rabakavi banahati and these places where weaving is one of the important practices there so this will be taught formally in schools so they are trying to find what is that area specialization and that has to be brought in the school framework that's that's very so important that they will be equipped to uh, start early okay so this multiple entry exit system in higher education can bring lot of uh, good things to the students so in terms of like one year you can exit two years you can exit three years you can exit if you want research you can do four years if you want masters you can do five years and you can also continue with your phd and so those who are highly focused on research and knowledge you can keep continuing but if you are very good at skills we have seen many of them even dropouts you know they are very good at those skills so number crunching using of excel i know people who are do number crunching like anything none of the college graduates are able to do it how is it possible because they have that kind of a skill so these skills start early and uh, see there are two types of skills one is disciplinary skills and one the other is the transferable skills transferable skills are across all the domains which is required which is they can live just start this is only about atmanirbhar bharat or whatever self reliant what we have talked about taking that into account this kind of a system has been brought about so i think vocational education is program comes like this along with the regular education that's that's very heartening again uh, to hear so uh, we i have one more question after that uh, we will be opening the floor to questions from the uh, audience here so uh, while there are you know again dime does and career opportunities that are available today to you know several students uh, yet a lot of students given to parental uh, pressure and they there there are, we do i mean i personally also know of a lot of cases where children are being forced to take a particular career path uh, out of peer pressure and parental pressure so do you think it's high time that irrespective of whether it's a private school or a government school uh, or a you know uh, public school do you think it's high time that they start having active counseling sessions for the students and the parents on a one to one basis um at from the senior school level onwards so that they both are conditioned and ensure that the child is happy with what they do as a career and not take it up as a job okay uh this is uh, i told you stakeholder consultation that has been done for this national education policy and parents were also a part of the national uh, the stakeholder consultation and then see why how the parents are reacting is based on how the system is working so they react to the system when once the systemic changes are happening their reactions will are also going to change correct so when you are opening up this multidisciplinary education there is a plethora of opportunities for the students it's all basket of courses that we are offering it is not one course so there are multiple things so there is no uh force that the parents can make now we had only the silos that were built among uh between these courses ba bcom bsc be mbbs like this you know this kind of silos were built when you remove those silos you know naturally the thinking at the thinking level when you have offer a choice then parents also start thinking like so that can happen and another thing is uh parent taking parents into confidence and then 
uh, telling them what is there in the national. I have al already consult, uh, conducted some webinars to parents also. Okay, many organizations conducted webinars to parents regarding the national education policy. So the parents' mindset has to change. Okay, and it is going to change because of this kind of a openness that is being built. Okay, an open system will always build an open ecosystem, right? right. So I'm sure that uh, that kind of a mindset change is going to happen. We the system was very closed. That's why we draw the parents to think in a very close structure. When the system opens, naturally we will drive the parents to think in a very open uh, manner, right? So I'm sure that uh, these changes are going to happen. The parents' mindset will also, also change. And you know, the sciences now, earlier, uh, there was a point in time where uh, BSc was not at all opted. I was working in some colleges where we had to close BSc course. Okay. okay, so BA course had to be closed. So everybody flocked to commerce, commerce, commerce kind of thing because of the opportunities. Right. But today it is not like that. When you have a, a general skill that is being imparted, students are today, see, we are not teaching even to the millennials. We are teaching to the Zoomers. Right. <laughs> who are born with all the technology. So they are starting with the technology. So that's the kind of uh, students that we have. So they are very fast. Their learning is very fast. And we need to adapt uh, ourselves to that. So many, uh, many experimental schools have also come and they are also doing such experiments at a very early age. Okay. So bringing uh, into fold all these experimental education into the normal course is the activity that is happening now. So I think. Uh, things will change and the parents mindset is also going to go uh, like uh, positively towards the children's choice and not their uh, pressure. Great. So, uh, Dr. Manasa, we have a question from Mr. Venkata Chalam R, who is currently there on our uh, discussion here today. He uh, wants to understand if you can highlight on the um, higher education and how the job orientation programs can be effectively implemented in our country. Uh, when we say job orientation programs, uh, are we speaking about uh, occasional courses? That is uh, one thing. Uh, see, actually, it has to be, it is a responsibility when we make an institutional development plan. Okay, now, whatever we are talking about institution development plan, and this institution development plan is a phase wise plan. So we need to plan out very clearly how this um, job orientation gets into the mainstream. So what we have done, I tell you, like we have 240 students in the first year and all the students, all the students will be working live with the startups. Okay. All the 240 students. Okay. So it is not as a summer internship project, but it is in the course. See, like what happens, you know, reduce your curriculum burden and allow opportunity for students to get that kind of an exposure. So only if we do that, you know, it is possible. I think uh, we can do, we can build a large number of job orientation programs within our own courses. We can do it and nobody stops you to introduce any certification course or all these, you know, we have myths that whatever university says, we'll have to fix to the structure. It's not like that. There are many things that we can do. Even NAC, National Assessment and Accreditation Gu Guidelines, will also say that how many job-oriented courses you are doing to the students. So right. we have to integrate them. And if we have to integrate, there should be an ecosystem within the institution. Always faculty is saying, no, 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 I have to finish the syllabus. Don't bring all this. If they say like that, then it will be a problem. So you have to have an institution development plan which paves the way, fixes this kind of a job orientation within your institution. So give ample time to that. Run classes maybe from eight to one. Allow the students three to five to work on these job oriented courses. So we are all overwhelmed with the content actually. 
So content has to be reduced. That's and even that's now, you know, when we set the syllabus, everybody starts putting all the content from all sides. That's not the right approach. Okay. See, there is a level of assimilation. What is required? I may be thinking that everything is important, right? But the thing is, are we really delivering what has to be delivered in the class? So reduce the content, give more opportunity for this kind of experiential learning and integrate projects in every possible uh, courses that, that is there. True, absolutely. So we have a question from one of our online viewers, Mr. Raghunandan SV. He asks, how do you think we can build a culture to ensure we engage all stakeholders in framing an effective education policy that helps connect the dots end to end? No, uh, when we say stakeholder connection, see, stakeholder uh, connection should happen at the grassroots. That's like no. stakeholder participation. See, in framing the national education policy, it has already been done, taking, uh, I'll tell you, a lack consultations have been done for the development of the policy. A lack and more, exactly to tell you, 155,000 consultations were done. Oh. I'm sorry, 155,000 stakeholders were involved. 100, 100 plus consultations were done. Okay, so uh, that is okay. But when we have to implement something you know it is the ecosystem that matters who are a part of the ecosystem we institutions are a part of this ecosystem so we'll have to build that kind of a stakeholder network so how are we going to build in all our activities you know bringing the stakeholders if we list the number of activities an institution does for a class you know you can see there will at least be some 300 activities that we have done 365 days there will be 300 different kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. So you have an ample opportunity to bring stakeholders in all these kind of aspects, right? Right. It is possible. It is possible. So grassroots stakeholder involvement has to happen rather than saying that stakeholder involvement has to happen at the policy level. It has already happened. So now it is our responsibility at institution level, bringing the stakeholders together and trying and understanding what they feel and how it is happening and make changes accordingly. So this is what I would like to say. Thank you. Uh, Namita Garg, uh, who is currently there on the NHRWA meet, uh, is asking, is there a policy for bag and uh, book limit? Because she has uh, witnessed uh, even KG kids carrying a, a very heavy weight load and where, you know, the time a proper timetable is not followed and they... Uh, don't have like free periods and so on. So I think that is one of the, I, I do remember that you did mention about this, but maybe if you could just reiterate a little for Namita's. Uh, yeah. See, one thing is uh, with respect to the uh, uh, school education, from right from ECC, that is when the child starts education, from there onwards, it has been decided uh, what needs, what is the foundational numeracy, for, what is the uh, literacy part that has to be taken about, what it should be able to do at the end of each year. So right now we don't have some, that national curricular framework is not enough for us to go that way because we are overburdening the children. So this kind of uh, psychologists have been consulted and child psychology has been taken into account and it has been decided what they'll have to learn at the end of each this thing. Earlier, this ACER reports, you know, used to say that fifth standard child is not able to do mathematics uh, like addition, sixth standard uh, child is not able to do multiplication. So all these problems have been taken into consideration and it has been done. So uh, it won't be a burden. Uh, the curricular, uh, the national curricular framework, which is going to come, is going to reduce all the burden of the children and making it more experiential. So that problem won't be there with respect to books. Even in higher education, you know, uh, every university need to have a, a division which works on the content. Okay, Con content to be made available. So content is not pushing the content on people. It is only 
to see how it has to be taken forward so more is more of experiential rather than content orientation that is it uh, Dr. Mansa, in fact, I have a question uh, of my own as well. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, we do know that each child is unique and they have their own skills. So uh, when it comes to the formal education system, do you think there is a, a possibility that we can introduce a system where, let's say, a student who is in grade five um, has is, is skilled enough in mathematics to do a grade seven uh, level of math? But uh, and maybe in other subjects, they're pretty much at their grade or at a lower grade. So do you think they can kind of progress in that one particular subject while uh, they do the others at their own pace uh, to whichever level of understanding that they have? But till uh, nine standard, uh, eight standard, you know, so it will be a common uh, curriculum that will be done from ninth onwards. Optional options will start. So whatever uh, students, if they are working well okay in a particular they are very skilled in uh, certain subjects they can always choose from their ninth itself but one more thing is uh, there is something on gifted children and gifted uh, children policy a lot of research is also happening with respect to gifted children so how they have to be incorporated i think uh, this will also be a part of the whole thing like how to treat children and what is the learning capabilities all these will be discussed enough from the school side school education side so i think it is going to happen this way okay gifted children policy is already there actually so there are certain uh, uh, if children are multi-talented or extra skilled you know promoting that see experimental schools will have to come if you do experimental schools you experiential right. schools you know then promotion is possible this way that's 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 nice. Yeah, and I like uh, being said. I'll tell you one thing: until and unless our teachers are sensitized in handling this policy, you know, then it is it will be very difficult. Teachers will have to be sensitized. We know how teachers operate. Not all, I'm telling, but at least those who are used to the older uh, traditional structures, you know, so they operate in a very different manner. So this kind of transfer transformation has to happen in the teachers. So uh, we are running short of time. So I'm just going to take one uh, more question. This is from uh, Professor Sundaramurthy, who's from Vemana Institute of Technology Industry. So um, he says that uh, the industry keeps complaining that students are not industry ready. So what has the industry done to bridge the gap? Uh, see, industry normally uh, provides for training opportunities. So they uh, take the students for internship and then convert them into PPOs. That, that system is also there, but it is mutual. That's what I've been telling. It is mutual. So we also need to train our students suitable to the industry because we had a lot of employability issues all these years. And then from our end, we need to do, and in campuses, you know, we'll have to, work with at least few companies who are working from the campus so this kind of a culture has to be changed so it is not at campuses we need to have industries who are working who will support the students and in industries they'll have to give at least a six months time for them to get adjusted and these policies hr policies will have to be very um like uh, lenient for the first six months <coughs> what we have observed is that many students who take up jobs you know they quit the first company when they join they quit very fast because they cannot get acclimatized to the new situation so academically it was very different organizationally it is very different so companies will have to insist the companies to create a policy of the first six months, whenever you do campus recruitments, the first six months will have easier ways of doing. Training has to be embedded properly and then make it, make them get accustomed to the whole system and then take them to uh, their roles. If you start putting pressure from the first day, our students face the same problem. The companies put pressure from the right from the first day. That's not the right thing. So some changes will have to happen at the company side also. 
they need to be a little slow but they are uh, they are focused on something else that's why they uh, they go with this kind of an approach so but it's always good that when companies take the students otherwise bring the companies much earlier to the institutions work with them let the students understand the culture that's why we need to do everything hands on so once we do that hands on you know then it will be much easier so our theory of that uh, content driven examination driven approach is that we'll have to break okay sure. we'll have to go experiential based and then we'll have to look at more opportunities with the industry and the stakeholders thank you dr mansa in fact i'm sorry we have a lot of questions so i'm just going to get take two more and extend the session by another 5 minutes maximum uh, so uh, sunanda mysore from our online uh, one of our online viewers is asking has the education department liaised with teacher training institutions to bring about a change at the foundation levels in terms of teachers understanding the philosophy of education okay so one thing <clears throat> there are a lot uh, uh, many things that have been suggested with respect to continuous development continuous and professional development of teachers actually in the national education policy okay and uh, the bed course which we were uh, having which was totally in silos you know that is going to get integrated with the mainstream education so that is also there so like how we offer commerce science and the arts similarly education will also be offered okay so uh, ncert is working on this particular aspect that how teacher training has to be done and how teachers will have to be equipped to deal with the new kind of an education system new mindsets of children okay that is being worked upon but the thing is until and unless we make attempts in our own institutions and do it it may not be possible we will, let us be the early birds and start in our own institutions but naturally from the top also many things are going to come and then this kind of a shift is going to happen because there is a separate section in national education policy on uh, professional and continuous development of teachers because teachers are the key right they are the ones who are going to tell you so it is it will happen absolutely um and our last question um uh, vandana uh, prasad who is there on the panel here today at the nhrwa is asking what steps are being taken to teach our culture and information that is available in our regional languages and um, you know uh, uh, primarily what she says is that as we know that there's a lot of information and knowledge that is available which uh, can help us progress and you know understand our past better and progress with a more uh, you know informed mindset okay indian knowledge systems ikc has been an integral part of the whole policy indian knowledge systems and today if you go through the ugc website or aact website so there is one particular tab on ikc itself it calls all the teachers students whoever wants to contribute knowledge in this particular area okay that is one thing uh, and other thing is regarding language development as i told you universities will have a language development center where it promotes uh, all kinds of indian languages and then it will take up uh, book writing in indian languages rather than english alone that is one more thing and then with respect to our ancient wisdom and uh, uh, all that we have national policy uh, integrates this kind of a thing in the curriculum itself okay so uh, many things for example now uh, a new uh, thing uh, based on iks you know teaching a course on business ethics right. self management leadership with bhagavad gita and all our uh, systems whatever ancient wisdom was there so that has been integrated so courses will be uh, many certification courses and courses in the framework itself has been integrated so that we teach our knowledge systems and you know that the books history books have been rewritten right ye uh, history books have been rewritten to bring out the right perspective of the indian culture so lot of things are happening so i think that this is one thing one of the primary agendas that we had okay 
reviving the Sanskrit language and then taking in uh, bilingual teaching that is mother tongue, encouraging teaching in the mother tongue. So these things, you know, have become an integral part of the policy and I think it's going to happen in a very, very big way. So we will not be like English oriented and thinking in a different style. But now it's already happen, happening, which I am observing that how integration is happening in our own courses. We are already teaching on Indian ethos uh, based on uh, uh, these uh, trigunas. And then uh, what is that? Uh, this one, Chatur uh, Purusharthas. So like that, you know, that that is coming uh, in the classrooms now. So right. student mindset will have to accept. They are doing it. So I think... Uh, yoga, integration of yoga, uh, well-being, health, all these have come into practice. Great. Um, thank you very much uh, for your valuable time, Dr. Manasa. It's been a pleasure and an honor, in fact, to engage with you in this very interesting conversation uh, today. Um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. D.S. Ramaprasad and Mr. Narsimha from the NHRWA for organizing this discussion and uh, the media partners, IASIA News Music, for the live broadcast uh, that uh, this uh, happening currently at across 170 plus countries. And uh, from Aisha, uh, I would like to thank the main uh, forces behind the parent channel, which is in Dallas, Texas, uh, Dr. Krishna Puttaparthi, who is the CEO and head of Aisha News, and uh, Anu Benakati, who is the chief operating officer of Aisha News, and the very dynamic uh, team in Bangalore of Aisha News Music, uh, Vidya Sagar, who is the chief operating officer, uh, Mr. Jayant, who is the head of creative design and technical, Vinuta Jayant and Kishore Bhatia from Dubai, who uh, head the public relations in India and Dubai, respectively. And, uh, of course, the social media managers, Anandita and Sagar. So, may I now request uh, Mr. Ramaprasad, the co-founder of NHRW, to please say a few words. Thank you, Kirtana, and thank you, Dr. Mansa. <clears throat> it was an excellent uh, insight and a lot of information which is there, which is very much required, the policies and procedures which has uh, been formed in the government uh, sector as well as the private, and what exactly it is required. Uh, uh, the knowledge, uh, as, you, uh, as you are rightly telling, that the knowledge is not the only thing. Experiential learning, what is uh, very much required uh, in the industry. And uh, as NHRWA, uh, what we are uh, actually focusing is that uh, we are bringing the bridge between the students and the corporate level. What is uh, corporate required, uh, students are not aware. What students are skilled, corporate are not aware or they are not well equipped. So we are trying to build the gap between the uh, students and we are trying to uh, you know, educate the corporate people to come and uh, educate the students what is your requirement based on that they can come and give uh, 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 train the, the students as for the requirement of uh, the corporates and uh, see that they are uh, from the day one they start working for the corporate according to the skills what is required in the companies. So this is one uh, aspect which we are doing as a uh, vision of uh, NHRWA. We just wanted to bring the rural areas, the un underprivileged students, at least we need to touch uh, 100 schools uh, and uh, give free education uh, for uh, uh, deserved students uh, who are uh, who are willing to learn, but they are not offered to uh, you know learn from uh, different. And we want to give the uh, identify the skills uh, what they are good at and give the skills uh, in coordination with the corporate or any uh, NGOs and uh, <coughs> organizations in the country. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Kirtana uh, for an excellent uh, coordination and uh, she's done uh, a beautiful job as uh, usual. And uh, I would like to thank uh, all the NHRWA members uh, who are presented and give your inputs and thoughts. And anything, uh, NHRWA members, I request uh, uh, any particular uh, topics that you wanted us to cover or we wanted uh, the industry experts to come into the forum and uh, give some uh, inputs. Uh, it will be highly grateful and uh, thankful uh, to all of you. It is not that, say, uh, according to what we need, uh, we, we think that this is good and based on that, uh, we are, we are uh, bringing the uh, industry experts. If you have any uh, ideas stating that uh, this is the industry which we wanted or these are the topics which we need to cover, we try our best to bring the expertise and uh, give the uh, uh, right uh, information to the people. And we just wanted to bring uh, uh, build the bridge between the students and the corporate community. 
so we can all of us put together we can uh, see that you no know, the society can be important we can give something back to the society so thank you very much thank you for to kit thank you thank you mr ram prasad uh, thank you everyone uh, present here today both at the nhrwa panel as well as uh, online uh, have a good weekend thank you dr manasa once again thank you Thank you.